Hi, this is Matt Baker, and today I'm going to show you the family tree of the Buddha, the central figure in the religion known as Buddhism. In addition to discussing his family tree, I'll also be answering the question, did the Buddha exist? And I'll be doing so in a similar manner to the video that I posted a few months ago on did Moses exist? So, in other words, we're going to look both at what Buddhist religious tradition has to say about the Buddha, as well as what the historical method has to say about him. Before we dive into his family tree, let's first take a look at when and where the Buddha lived. Let's start with when, using my timeline of world history chart. Note that the thick brown line on this chart is 600 BCE. This is an important year in world history because it very roughly marks the turning point between the end of the Iron Age and the start of what historians call classical antiquity. Basically, classical antiquity is when humans first started to write history in a more straightforward, literal manner, kind of like we do today. Before this, history was usually passed down orally and was almost always mixed with mythology and legend. That's why it's much harder to determine whether or not someone from the Bronze Age or Iron Age existed, such as Moses, than it is to determine whether or not someone from classical antiquity existed, such as the Buddha or Jesus. You'll note that the period in which the Buddha lived is also known as the Axial Age. It was during the Axial Age, from 600 BCE to 300 BCE, that most of humanity's most important philosophical foundations were laid. And what makes the Axial Age so interesting is that these foundations were laid pretty much simultaneously, yet independently, in several different locations. So, around the same time that the Buddha was walking the earth, so were Chinese philosophers such as Confucius and Greek philosophers such as Plato. It was also during the lifetime of the Buddha that the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which we discussed last week on this channel, was dominating the entire Middle East and that the Jews living in that empire were putting together what would eventually become known as the Old Testament. So yeah, a lot of important changes were happening in the world when the Buddha lived. Let's now talk about where the Buddha lived. To the east of the Achaemenid Persian Empire were 16 Mahajanapadas, which dominated North India. Mahajanapada means something like Great Realm. And these can be thought of as mini-kingdoms, although in some cases they were actually republics governed by oligarchs. There are three in particular that I'd like to point out. First, Kuru. The Kuru kingdom is where the Hindu epic the Mahabharata is set, although the events in that story supposedly occurred many centuries before Buddha's time. We did a video on that topic, which I'll link to in the description if you're interested. Second, I want to point out Magadha. Starting around the time of the Buddha, Magadha started to become the most powerful of the 16 Mahajanapadas. In fact, it would eventually grow and grow and come to rule virtually all of the Indian subcontinent under Emperor Ashoka, whom we'll talk about later. But the third and most important Mahajanapada I want to point out is Kosala, because it was within the realm of Kosala that the Buddha was born, in what is today Nepal. Near the kingdom of Kosala were two smaller realms that were basically vassal states of Kosala. These two realms were located on either side of a river and were ruled by the Shakya clan and the Kaliya clan. It was from the Shakya clan that the Buddha descended. Now, the first thing you need to know is that Buddha is a title, not a name. So when Buddha was born, he wasn't actually called Buddha or 
the Buddha yet. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he was born as a prince. His father, Suddhodana, is often referred to in Buddhist literature as the king of the Shakyas, although king is probably not the correct term from a technical point of view. Historically, he was something closer to an oligarch or a tribal leader. But for the sake of simplicity, I'll be using terms like king, queen, and prince throughout. Suddhodana married two sisters, Pajapati and Maya, from the Kolya royal family. Their brother, Supabuddha, would go on to become the Kolya king. Maya was the mother of the Buddha, and there is an elaborate story concerning her that relates to the Buddha's conception and birth. One night during a full moon, she had a vivid dream in which a white elephant holding a lotus flower appeared, circled her three times, and then entered her womb through her right side. This was supposedly the moment that the Buddha was conceived. According to the story, she then gave birth to Prince Siddhartha, exactly ten lunar months later, but then she died shortly thereafter. Siddhartha was therefore raised by his stepmother and aunt, Pajapati. Pajapati and Suddhodana had a son and a daughter, who were thus the half-siblings of the Buddha. They were named Nanda and Nanda. Note that while the English spelling is the same, the pronunciation is different. Nanda, Nanda. Both of Buddha's siblings would go on to become his followers, but both also had their struggles, which are described in Buddhist literature. But I'm getting ahead of the story. Prince Siddhartha married his cousin Yosadhara from the Kolya clan, and together they had a son named Rahula. However, one day Prince Siddhartha left the palace and came to know about human suffering. Because of this, he decided to leave his family and life of luxury and live a life of extreme poverty and meditation instead. But after several years as an ascetic, he achieved enlightenment and became the Buddha. The word Buddha meaning one who has awakened. After enlightenment, the Buddha started teaching others about what he called the middle path between self-indulgence on one hand and self-mortification on the other. In this video, I'm not going to go into detail on Buddha's teaching. However, if you're interested to learn more about Buddhism in general, I recommend this overview by Cogito, which I'll link to in the description. For now, I simply want to point out a few more people in his family tree. During his lifetime, the Buddha had ten main disciples, two of whom were his paternal cousins, Anuruddha and Ananda. Ananda, in particular, is an important figure within Buddhist history, as he was the primary attendant of the Buddha, and the one who is credited with remembering all of the Buddha's teachings, so that they could eventually be passed down and recorded. However, on his mother's side of the family, the Buddha had another cousin named Devadatta, who was his wife's brother, and who appears in many Buddha stories as the main enemy of the Buddha, even though he too was one of the Buddha's followers. For example, there's several stories where he tries to kill the Buddha, and others where he tries to take over the leadership. In the end, he gets swallowed up by the earth and dies. Now, although the Buddha is primarily associated with Buddhism, he is also a revered figure within Hinduism as well, and therefore he has been integrated into the overall scheme of Hindu legend and lore. As I mentioned, the Buddha was born as a prince and came from a ruling family. This means he belonged to the Kshatriya caste, or Varna. For most of India's history, Hindu society was divided into four main social classes, called Varnas. There are the Brahmins, who are the priests and scholars. 
the Kshatriyas, who are the rulers and warriors, the Vaishyas, who are the farmers and merchants, and the Shudra, who are the laborers and servants. In ancient times, the Kshatriya had two main dynasties, the Suryavamsa, or solar dynasty, and the Chandravamsa, or lunar dynasty. Note that Surya is the Hindu god of the sun, and Chandra is the Hindu god of the moon. The Buddha and his family are said to come from the solar dynasty, along with Rama, who is the main character from the Hindu epic, the Ramayana. In contrast, the main characters from the other big Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, are said to have come from the lunar dynasty. These include Arjuna and Krishna. According to most Hindus, Rama, Krishna, and Buddha were all incarnations of the god Vishnu. Vishnu is supposed to be incarnated ten times. Rama was number seven, Krishna was number eight, Buddha was number nine, which leaves one more still to come. Okay, now that we've discussed the various religious traditions about the Buddha, let's now address the question. Did he actually exist as a historical person? In my video about Moses, I talked about three methods that can be used to prove a person's existence. The best, of course, being physical remains. Now, one thing I failed to mention in that video is that there is a difference between physical remains that are available for scientific testing and those that are inaccessible due to religious reasons. So, for example, many people pointed out that the physical remains of the Prophet Muhammad do exist and that they are located in the Prophet's mosque in Medina. However, we have no way of proving whether or not this is actually true because I'm pretty sure that the caretakers of that mosque are never going to allow any scientists to do tests on the supposed remains of Muhammad, as that would be considered very irreverent. The same is true of the Buddha. There are many temples throughout the world that claim to have physical relics of the Buddha, such as the Temple of the Tooth located in Sri Lanka. I've actually visited that temple many times when I worked in Sri Lanka as a teacher. But like the tomb of Muhammad, scientists are unable to examine any of the supposed relics of the Buddha, and therefore they cannot be used as evidence for the Buddha's existence. After physical remains, the next best thing is other types of archaeological evidence, such as stone inscriptions. Now, when it comes to the Buddha, we do not have any archaeological evidence that dates to his lifetime. However, we do have inscriptions that mention him dating to about 200 years after his death. Remember Emperor Ashoka that I mentioned earlier? He was the guy who united the entire Indian subcontinent for the first time, bringing to an end the period of the 16 Mahajanapadas. Aside from the Bronze Age Indus Valley script, the next oldest inscriptions found in India date from the time of Ashoka. He is known for having erected several pillars with various edicts using the ancient Brahmi script. Well, the pillar shown here contains the word Sakya Muni, which means the Shakya sage, and it is the earliest known reference to the Buddha. But again, this inscription dates to around 200 years after the Buddha's death. So although that's pretty good in terms of archaeological evidence, this one inscription alone isn't enough to settle the question. We must therefore also look at a third type of evidence, textual sources. And when it comes to the Buddha, we have two main sources. One is the Pali Canon, which dates to around 30 BCE and is the standard set of Buddhist scriptures used by the Theravada branch of Buddhism, practiced in countries like Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Myanmar. 
The other source is the Chinese canon, which dates to around 400 CE and is the standard set of scriptures used by the Mahayana branch in places like China, Japan, and Korea. Now, as I mentioned in my Moses video, historians use several criteria to determine whether or not a source can be trusted when it comes to historical accuracy. The first question they ask is, does the source match the archaeological record? And when it comes to early Buddhist texts, the answer is, generally speaking, yes. The overall setting described in the stories about Buddha's life matches well with what we know of the Mahajanapada period in Indian history. Many small city-states ruled by local kings rather than a huge centralized state, which came later. Secondly, are there multiple sources that all tell the same story? In this case, the answer is both yes and no. On the one hand, we do not have any ancient sources outside of Buddhist literature that can confirm the more fantastical elements of his life story, such as his ability to perform miracles. However, on the other hand, we do have several Greek and Roman sources that seem to back up the general fact that the Buddha was an important sage or teacher from India and that he founded an important religious movement. Third, is there any chance that the source is biased? Well, here, like all religious literature, one has to admit that, yes, the early Buddhist canons are biased because they, after all, were made by followers of the religion, not by impartial observers. But, like I said, if you strip away the supernatural elements from these stories, there is quite a bit of consistency when it comes to the basics. Next, let's consider how much time passed between the death of the Buddha and the earliest mention of him in a non-religious source. I did this previously with Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad and noted that the answers for them were 1,000, 63, and 8, respectively. From those figures, you can definitely see that Moses is the odd man out. What about Buddha? First off, it's a bit tricky because there are two different death dates that scholars tend to give. It's either 480 BCE or 400 BCE. But if we go with an average between those two and then measure from the date that Ashoka erected his pillars, we get 184 years. So you can see that this puts the Buddha in a category more similar to Jesus than to Moses or Muhammad. Here's a very important chart that I showed in my Moses video. Note that both Jesus and the Buddha lived during the period shown in the middle, in yellow, called classical antiquity. Generally speaking, the likelihood of a person from classical accounts being historical is always going to be much higher than that of a person from Bronze Age or Iron Age accounts. That's why I would tend to label figures such as Achilles, David, or Arjuna as legendary. But figures such as Julius Caesar, Jesus, or Buddha as historical. The final question we have to consider is, what genre of writing was used? Well, like most religious literature, the main purpose of the Buddhist scriptures is not to serve as a record of historical events, but rather to pass on certain spiritual teachings. In this case, this is often done in the form of sutras, which are short, wise sayings attributed to the Buddha. Okay, so what's our conclusion? Well, based on all of these facts, I think it is fair to say that the Buddha was most likely a historical person who lived on the Indian subcontinent around 500 BCE and who became a well-known spiritual teacher. As for the many acts and sayings attributed to him, well, like in the case of Jesus, that is more a matter of personal faith, not of historical fact. 
Okay, so that was a look at the family tree of the Buddha, as well as the historical evidence for his existence. Thanks for watching.